Well, we're still rejoicing in a wonderful uh, weekend. Last weekend, so grateful to have the Jets with us and a good ladies' conference and a good day yeah. Sunday. Thankful for that and looking forward to what God has for us tonight. We continue and we'll conclude our series on the, in the life of Absalom. Let me remind you of a couple things that are on the horizon here. Uh, first of all, for our men's leadership conference that's over in Indianapolis, October 13th and 14th, sign-up sheets on the bulletin board. So men uh, and young men, if uh, teenagers want to go with, with your father, uh, that'd be great and encouraged. Um, you need to get signed up, uh, of course, by uh, September the 20th. So that is coming uh, quickly, all right? So it's a week from tonight. So get signed up if you're not already done so and uh, more information uh, there on the bulletin board. Then the next uh, teen activity will be a week from Saturday. That's teen hiking activity. So hopefully all our young people will be able to participate in that activity and enjoy time uh, together, uh, fellowship and in the outdoors, and, and uh, hopefully enjoy some of the fall uh, scenery uh, there. Of course, there's other things going on there in your bulletin. Do be mindful as well uh, for our married couples and couples retreat at the end of October. Hope that you part those dates out. We will have some more information about that uh, very, very soon. All right, my dad or Pastor Meredith will come receive our offering tonight. Right, good to see everybody tonight. Uh, let's see, I think uh, we've got a welder in the church, a real rich guy. I think it's his birthday. Oh. Happy birthday, welder man. <laughs> and, uh, let's have the ushers come. And, and uh, tonight the offering goes to uh, Bethel Baptist School. How's it feel to be old? <laughs> I take back the happy birthday. <laughs> Just birthday. All right. Michael, we thank the Lord for your offering tonight. Dear Lord, I'm thankful for this day. Thank you for all the love you've shown us this week and this month, and this year, Lord, I'm thankful that we can meet in your house tonight, Lord. Please bless this offering, may it be used however you need it to be used. Please also bless the service tonight as we conclude our series. In your name, amen. Amen. For playing tonight, Parker. All right, we're on to 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel chapter 18. And when you found it, uh, or if you haven't found it, or still willing, if you'll stand out of respect for the scriptures as we read our text tonight, we're going to begin in verse 6. And we'll just open with verses 6 through 9 here. If you'll follow along, please, as I read 2 Samuel 18, beginning with verse 6. So the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was in the wood of Ephraim. So this would be, the people would be King David and his, the men that went with him, his mighty warriors, and the soldiers that went with him against Israel, which would have been the the group that Absalom and his attempted coup here has led Israel to war with King David. Uh, so it was a civil war. Uh, nothing civil about it, but we understand <coughs> what that term means. Verse 7. Wherefore the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David 
there was a great slaughter that day of 20,000 men. For the battle was there scattered over the face of all the country, and the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule. The mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. I want to talk to you tonight as we conclude this series in the life of Absalom, who is unfortunately a tremendous example of a rebel and rebellion in the Bible. I want to talk to you tonight, and I title my thoughts uh, this way, The End of Rebellion. The end of rebellion. Father, help us, I pray, as we look into your word, as we see truth here from the life of Absalom and some of these other characters mentioned in this account. Lord, I pray that you challenge our hearts. If there be rebellion in us, a spirit of rebellion, Lord, help us to, to confess it and to turn from it, to repent of it. Lord, uh, give us... Uh, more insight, more wisdom, and how to help others we know who perhaps are uh, living in rebellion, and the, the tragedy that that is, and the, the loss. Lord, work in our midst. Give me wisdom as I, I speak tonight. Lord, we're thankful, we're grateful that in Christ uh, you can answer any sin. If we'll confess our sin to you and we'll trust Christ, Lord, uh, you promise to forgive. You promise to give salvation. Lord, we're grateful for this. So. Lord, I pray you'd help us to see that truth at the conclusion of the message tonight as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. So let's review a little bit of our study here of the life of Absalom. We've seen that uh, he thought he had cause for rebellion, which is not an uncommon position for any rebel to be in. Every, every person who's rebelling against any authority in their life believes they have cause for their rebellion. And since I brought that point up again, let me remind us of this. We're also living in a, a time in our culture here in America that I've noticed in great detail that most everyone thinks are the exception to any rule. I know the street sign says this is one way, but I'm only going over a block, so it's okay for me. People live in this way. I mean, I, we see this happen. I mean, the explanation is, well, I was only going that far. I didn't hurt anybody. Is not hurting anybody, the, the standard we're living by now, I, I'm not sure that's the way we should be. But that's one silly example, rather pointed, no doubt. But all, all who rebel against authority uh, think that they have cause for what, what they're doing. And we noted this principle that is so true. It's been true in my life when, when I've been in, when I rebel or had a season of rebellion. Perhaps you've been able to identify this as well in your life that rebels believe a lie. We believe a lie about authority. And ultimately, we're, when someone is rebelling, we're, we're believing a lie about God. We think that God does not have our best in his mind, and that if we'll go around God, we can have things better. Absalom believed a lie about his father, King David. Absalom believed a lie about God. Absalom thought that he should be king. He believed a lie. Was Absalom justified in some of his frustration? Absolutely, we've seen that. Why didn't David deal with, with uh, Amnon sooner? I, I, we can see that. I, I would agree with that. In some ways, we can think, well, he's exercising some righteous indignation here and standing up for uh, the name of his, his sister. We, we, can, we can understand that. Uh, but Absalom never looked in himself for any wrong or fault. The fault was always with someone else. And and rebels are, have an amazing ability of doing that. We saw then three evidences of rebellion that we should guard against, and that was his display of a pseudo-authority. He acted like he was more than he was. Remember, he set up like a like we would say today, he had his own uh, presidential motorcade going, you know, it was chariots then, but and horsemen and people before him and went around the city. And it looked like that he was <clears throat> he was the crown, the crown king. Uh, that was not the case. He was drawing people unto himself, and we saw the warning there about bringing dissension, discord. Uh, be careful about communicating with people in your home, in your church, 
even at work, that are always nitpicking the authority. They're sowing discord, they're sowing dissension, they're whisperers, they're gossips, they're backbiters. Uh, the, devil, uh, the Bible warns us much about that tool of Satan in our life. We need to be careful and cautious about that. And uh, we also noted that rebels seek to, to uh, deceive authority. Any one of those three could be a detriment to us. Uh, uh, displaying an authority we don't have, drawing people aside to ourselves, or seeking to deceive the authority in our life. Last, not, last time, last week, we noted the high cost of rebellion and that we see in Absalom, which is true of most rebels, that they give up their real relationships for fraudulent ones. How often we've seen a young person betray the real relationships of, of their parents, of a youth pastor or their pastor or some other uh, godly person in their life for a fraudulent relationship, a flimsy relationship with someone who they think is the greatest thing ever. And boy, how deadly and how dangerous that can be. Uh, Absalom gave up his relationship uh, with his father, his earthly father, as well as with his heavenly father, he betrayed betrayed both. Um, so uh, they gave up real relationships. He, he gave up his royalty. You know, Absalom had the opportunity to be part of the, continue to be part of the royal family. We don't know what capacity that would have been had, had Absalom gotten right. Now, if we know the rest of the story, we're thankful for Solomon. And there are a lot of pictures of God's grace and mercy and long-suffering uh, displayed there with Solomon, the wisest man who, who uh, ever lived outside of Christ. Uh, recorded there in the, in the Bible, and God used him mightily, but we don't know what the story would have been for Absalom had he gotten right. But he gave up his relationship, his real relationship, his royalty, and then also he gave up his recourse. You know, Absalom's wrongs far out, out, uh, exceeded the wrongs he was frustrated with by multiples. Absalom's crimes were, were, were more uh, gruesome and ugly than the ones he was frustrated with to justify his own rebellion. So he, he gave up. He gave up so much in order to, to rebel. Tonight, I want us to see the end of rebellion. When we rebel against God, we have two possible results. Two possible results, right? One is confession and repentance. And that's the result we should all choose. Confession, agree with God about our rebellion, and repent of our rebellion and turn away from it. Return to a right relationship with God. That's, that's one possible end of rebellion. And I hope that all of us can see in our life where there have been times when we have ended our rebellion by confessing our sin to God and repenting of our sin and, and turning back to the Lord. If you're saved tonight, you ended that rebellion against God. You were rebelling against, rebelling against God's way, and you came to faith in Christ. You understood yeah. you were a sinner. You confessed your sin to God and trusted Christ as your Savior. You ended that rebellion against, against God, thinking you can be saved some other way, or you didn't need to trust Christ, but you ended that, and you trusted Christ. That's the right end to rebellion. The wrong end to rebellion would be to continue in rebellion against God, it's his word, his will, his way. By the way, his will and way are, are always um, subservient to his word. Right? So right. when we say God's word, will, and way, we're not talking about three different things. We're talking about three congruent things. Right? God's, God's word, his will, and his way. When we, when we uh, turn, turn to God and we, we follow him, we can, we can see fruit. When we continue to reject God's word, will, and way, we're headed toward ruin. Unfortunately, many rebels, many who are rebelling against God, like Absalom, choose the latter. For many reasons, I'm too far gone. There's no hope for me. You know, that's never the case. Right. Long as there's, long as there's life, there's opportunity. As long as you're breathing, there's opportunity. Opportunity. I, I do not recommend uh, you waiting to your deathbed to be uh, converted or get right with God, but I'm thankful that you could be. Right. I've witnessed a few of them, but I will say this. They've only been a few of many. 
people who wait for their deathbed to get right with God are, are, are not too bright. You're not guaranteed the deathbed, by the way. That's right. You drive down the road this week, you notice anybody texting and driving and sliding over into your lane? If you've been paying attention, you know that somebody, uh, our life could be taken out in, a, in, a, in an instant. Right. We need to be ready to, to meet the Lord. I want us to note three things here about the end of rebellion. First of all, this great slaughter, verses 7 and 8. The result, the resulting fruit of the rebellious crowd is poisonous. It's deadly. You know, all of our lives are producing fruit. Each one of our lives, all, each one of our lives are producing fruit, right? We're either producing good fruit or bad fruit. The fruit of rebellion is poisonous, and it is deadly. We see that in the life of Absalom. The fruit of Absalom's life is poisonous, and it's deadly. I would challenge you, if we've studied the life of Absalom, we, I tried, I worked very hard at trying to come up with some good qualities in his life. They're hard to find in there, aren't they? The fruit of rebellion is, is not good fruit. It's bad fruit. There was this, this great, great slaughter that is mentioned here. 20,000 men lost their lives so that Absalom could try to become king or gain a position that did not belong to him. Note this. They followed Absalom. Absalom was the popular choice, but he was not God's choice. And so we need to be careful about getting on the bandwagon, wrong bandwagons in our life. We'll mention a little bit more about that here in just a moment. But I, I want to make an application here about this great slaughter. The resulting fruit of the rebellious crowd is, is poisonous. It's, it's deadly. You know, so many churches have been split. We're talking about good churches. We're talking about people who had a passion for God, who had a passion to see people uh, saved, uh, added to, to, to the family of God and growing the kingdom of God, trying to serve God faithfully. So many churches have been split, they've been weakened, and some have even been eliminated by the dissentious tongue of the envious. And that's exactly what Absalom was. He divided, he divided the kingdom, he was envious of his father, he was envious of so many things, he drew people to himself, he set up this, this coup uh, to run his dad out of town, and he, it seemed like Absalom was winning. It seemed like, well, this is a guy we need to get behind. I mean, Absalom's the next king. That's obvious. David's gone. I mean, he fled. We might as well get behind Absalom. <coughs> I remember in our last message, we read that portion there. They went in their, their simplicity. They, well, what is going on here? They, they weren't thinking. I, I, I would say this about someone who's simplistic. My terminology is this. There's someone who doesn't think past their nose. Right? You're not, you're not thinking a, a step or two ahead. You know, it's wise, wise to be thinking a few steps down the road, at least. Right, and so they they weren't they were fo following him. The the number here of those look all twenty thousand of these that died died a premature death. Right. We read it in its history. Yeah, that's the way it is. They they did not have to die here. Right. They were following a rebel and they died. You say, do you think all of them were on Israel's side? I I, I doubt it. There are probably some on David's side too. When we when 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 we cause dissension, when we rebel against God, it is deadly. And sometimes there are, there are casualties. That we, we, in war, they call it collateral damage. Innocent people who lose, it, lose their lives just trying to live their lives and be, be faithful to God. Uh, when we rebel, it doesn't just impact us. That's the point. 20,000 men. Who's responsible for that? Absalom. That's right. When you rebel against God, you're responsible for the consequences. And since I brought that up, get out of the blame game. Amen. Get out of the blame game. It's a no-win situation. All of us have been done wrong. Until you get away from the blame game, you're not going to see success or victory over the, the over areas you've been done wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, have, I can't tell you the number of people. I, good people. I'm not about good people. Like frustrated about something that happened 15 years ago. I'm going, 
Boom, it's over. Let it go. God's still good. He's still on the throne. He loves you, doesn't he? Yes. yes. Then let's serve God. Well, this brother did that. He's not here. If he is, get away with him. She said this. Go talk to her about it. Talk to God about it. Amen. Build a bridge. Get over it. I'm serious. I'm serious about this. People, look, we got people who refuse to serve God because they were done wrong by someone a decade ago. When you think about how silly that is, you're not going to serve the king of kings because someone who claimed to be a child of the king did you wrong? Like, wrap your brain about how inconsistent that logic is. God has never done you wrong. Amen. He never will. He's, he's faithful. The number of those who died as premature death, all because of this rebellious infighting. Proverbs 13, 20 says this, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Absalom's companions were destroyed. 20,000. Our friends, our acquaintances, and the direction we're headed, heading, they do matter. By the way, again, I brought that up, so I'll, let me say this. The direction we're heading matters, and the direction of other people matters. Sometimes you see enough red flags and you go, whoa, uh -oh. we're going to rein things in here. Hey, parents, see some red flags with some of your kids. You need to rein them in. Or we become experts at uh, saying, yeah, we see red flags in everybody else's kids. We got red flags in our own kids. You need to rein your own in. And we need to, the younger they are, the more uh, Restriction and parameter and authority you have exercised there to, to, to hold them in those guardrails to keep them from getting off track in life. Rules are guardrails on the road of life to keep us from getting off track. Uh, establish good, good guidelines in your home. Absalom may have been the populace, but he certainly wasn't a man who was pursuing God. We need to be following and acquainting ourselves with people who have a passion for God. Those are the kind of people you want to be close to. Make sure your friendships are drawing you closer to God and not deterring your walk with Him. Make sure your acquaintances are helping draw you closer to God and not being a conflict or causing a difficulty in your relationship with God. I'm not, look, we need to win the lost. We need to reach the lost. We need to, to, to encourage people to get, get right with God. But we can do so without buddying or palling with them. Right? Right? Um, Make sure you know what your purpose is. Make sure your friendships are drawing you closer to God, not deterring your walk with Him. The second thing I want us to consider is this gruesome stabbing. Notice when we verse, pick it up in verse 9, we'll read down through 15. This is some kind of something here. Absalom met the, the servant, some kind of something. I don't know what that means, but, but it's something. All right. Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under a thick thick bows of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went, went away. And a certain man saw it, and told Joab, and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. Joab said unto the man that told him, Behold, thou sawest him, why didst thou not smite him there to the ground? I, I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. And the man said unto Joab, by the way, girdle there means a, a suit of clothes, all right? Verse 12. And the man's, helps us to understand this thing, right? Some of these boys are going, why would a man want a girl? Yeah. You shouldn't. Okay, all right. <clears throat> we have to say that these days too, don't we? Okay. Sorry. Back to our regular scheduled scripture reading here. Verse 12. And the man said unto Joab, though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, yet would I not put forth mine hand against the king's son? For in our hearing the king charged thee and Abishai and Atei, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Of course, we know earlier in the passage, David had said, uh, deal kindly with, with my son, with, with Absalom, all right? Verse 13, otherwise I should have wrought falsehood against mine own life, for there is no matter hid from the king, and thou thyself wouldst have set thyself against me. So Joab, you wouldn't have stood up for me if I had done that. And then we read verse 14. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And ten young men that bear Absalom's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. A gruesome stabbing. What I gather from this text is not only we see that Absalom's hung in this tree, we'll talk about that in a moment, but 
that Absalom died a very slow, a very fearful, and a very painful death. Now, how'd you get that out of that passage? Well, let me, let me try to give you some evidence for my claims. First of all, the thing we see about this is that he was snared in a tree by his, his head. We would rightly assume that his long hair had something to do with this. Right? Now, whether or not his, he got hung up around his neck, we would assume that if he had been hung up by, by his neck in an oak tree, he would have been able to get himself uh, loose. He was uh, a younger man, a uh, strong man. There was no blemish found in him, remember, but he, he was known for his long hair. He gloried in his hair. He, he really thought he was all that, his, his long hair. Uh, the Bible, by the way, still uh, condemns long hair on men. Nature does as well. It's unnatural. 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, is it, it is a shame unto him? Yeah. The Holy Spirit, under the, with the pen of the Apostle Paul, is saying there, uh, look, nature even tells you this, right? Shame for a man to have, have long hair. And so uh, we, we rightly assume that his hair had something to do with him getting hung up in this, this tree. Uh, I think another application that we should not, not fail to make here is, is it's wise to point out the danger of having a big head. I'm not, not talking about the size of the head that God gave you. I'm talking about the balloon head. Absalom, all of us would agree was full of himself. That's right. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride shall bring him low. Absalom's pride shall sure brought him low. Snared in a tree by his head. This is the guy who just a few verses earlier in the Bible has set up this chariot and all these men that ran before him and he's taken over the kingdom. He's, he's violated ten of his father's concubines in a public fashion. He set himself up as if he is the man. He's the popular guy. All of Israel is with Absalom. David has fled the place. I mean, Absalom's head's just swelling and swelling and swelling. Ahithophel, David's favorite counselor, the one who when he spoke, it was as if God spoke, was on Absalom's team. I mean, Absalom just thought, I got it all together. I've got, I've got the world by the tail. It's hung up in an oak tree by his head. You realize how easy it would be for God to take any one of us out? But I see here not only that he was snared in this tree and this, this gruesome stabbing we, we see, he was stabbed, I want us to think about this, by a skilled warrior. You ever read this and go, no. Joab knew how to fight, didn't he? Everybody know enough of the history here of Israel to understand? Joab was a mighty warrior, right? He knew how to fight. He knew how to conduct war. Joab knew how to kill someone. And if you know some people, perhaps uh, military or uh, otherwise, who, who uh, I, I remember talking with some people who've been through some, not just basic training in their particular branch, but maybe some elevated training and and uh, you talk to some of these guys, I mean, uh, and if, if you can get them to open up with you a little bit, you discover, uh, you're sitting there talking with them, I mean, they could take you out and you wouldn't even know what hit you. Boom. You'd be, you'd be, they've been trained to, to, to war, to the battle. Joab, and what I'm saying is this, Joab knew how to kill somebody <clears throat> with one stab. Why did he take three? And now, know something else here about this. He took three, three darts. Why, why, would he need, why would he need three? The word translated heart here, by the way, in, in our Bible, of course, it would originally have been Hebrew, uh, indicates the middle of something. So what I gather from this, and I've studied this and read this, and the fact that he took three darts, and he stabbed him with the three darts, and then we see that his ten armor bearers come around and finish him off. I think Absalom stabbed him in a way to inflict pain, to inflict fear. Joab stabbed him in a way to inflict pain and fear so that Absalom suffered. 
Remember that Joab was the one who had brought Absalom back to the kingdom and tried to reunite him with his father. Joab had been his friend, but Absalom had betrayed Joab's trust. And Joab was getting even. He would not only know how to kill someone quickly, he would also now know how to inflict a slow, painful death. And then he was slain by these 10 young soldiers. I, I think about that setting, if you could picture that. It's 10 young soldiers. So he was, he was consumed with physical agony because of the pain of these stabbings. He's, he's hung up here helpless and uh, hung in, in this tree. Joab's here. Ten of his soldiers are all around him. Can you imagine the fear, the anxiety that we've been consumed with? I mean, just a few moments ago, he was the great new king of Israel riding off to take David out, and he was going to take over the land and the kingdom. And now, just moments later, he's fearing for his life. Not only we see the, the physical uh, pain that, and agony that he would suffer, but I think also about the psychological anguish that would have consumed him in those moments before he died with those soldiers that, that surrounded him. The Bible says the way of transgressors is hard. In Job chapter 5, uh, if you, verses 12 through 14, the Bible says this. He disappointeth the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. Now, what happened with Absalom? Verse 13 says, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the forward is carried headlong. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope in the noonday as in the night. Uh, Absalom, <laughs> Absalom lost everything. This was, this was a gruesome stabbing. There had been this great slaughter. But lastly tonight, I want us to consider, if you look down at verse 33 of our text, a grievous sadness. Verse 33. Of course, Absalom was killed and the messengers have come and told King David about it. Verse 33. And the king, of course David, was much moved. He went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son. And then down into chapter 19. And it was told Joab, Behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people, for the people heard say that day how the king was grieved for his son. A grievous sadness. Two, two thoughts here about this. First of all, we see David's compassion for his lost son. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 10 and verse 7, The memory of the just is blessed but the name of the wicked shall rot. Now, I'm thankful to have known some godly people in my life who are with the Lord. And their memory is blessed to me. I've thought about some this week. And in fact, I've communicated with some other people about some people that we know, we, we both knew, and now they're with the Lord. That the memory of the just is blessed. But I tell you what, it's not so about the wicked. We've spent five messages studying the life of Absalom. And again, it's rottenness, isn't it? We can learn from it. He's given for an example to us to warn us against being rebellious against God. We can learn from it. But there's nothing good about his life. The name of the wicked shall rot. David's compassion for his lost son. That's heartrending and heartbreaking to see someone go the way of rebellion. Because we know there's consequence to follow. There's always consequence to follow. But that leads me to my second point here about this grievous sadness. And that is Christ's compassion for the lost today. We see David's compassion for his son. He, he, he knew, look, David knew, David understood that, that, that Absalom was going to die. He tried to find a different way, but he knew, he knew, he knew that was going to happen. Right? In order for the kingdom to be, be, go back to the way it should be, uh, Absalom was either going to have to get right with God and with David, or he was going to be eliminated. Right? The same thing had happened with King Saul. He had left that in God's hands. Right? He, he understood that. He grieved for Saul. This was a, 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 a sadness. It was a sadness for his son. He wasn't happy that his son was gone, but he understood the consequence of, of Absalom's rebellion. 
Christ has great compassion for you and for me today. In Romans 5, 8, the Bible says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, Christ didn't need to go to the cross for himself. He's God. Why would Christ go to the cross and suffer and die? Because of his compassion. Are you listening? For rebellious people such as you and I. Right. His compassion. David had a compassion. David's a type or a picture of Christ in this, this story here. He had a compassion for his rebellious son, even though his rebellious son was completely against him. Look, Christ loves you. Christ loves me. He has compassion for you and I, even though we, were, we are rebellious against him. But God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look, part of being a sinner is rebelling against God. He loves us so much. He went to the cross and died for us. He gives us the opportunity to be redeemed. Redeemed. Redemption. That's a Bible word, but one we probably is a little easier for us to understand. Maybe you've redeemed a certificate or a coupon at a store. I know most of the time those are done by our devices now. You know, you save the coupon or whatever, and they do a scan a barcode or whatever. But nonetheless, you understand what we're talking about. You, you redeem a certificate for, for a discount or for an item, right? Redemption is God buying us back, buying rebel souls back from the consequence of our sin because of the payment that has been paid by the shed blood of Christ at Calvary. He redeems us. He buys us back from our just end. Our just consequence is death. Eternal death in a place called hell and then the lake of fire. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us while we were still rebelling against him. God's, God's great compassion for us is displayed by Christ. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God went to the cross, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, went to the cross to buy us back from our sin's penalty. Uh, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through uh, Jesus Christ our Lord, right? It's, it's, it's through, through, did I get that right? Yeah. Okay, all right. Had a brain freeze there for a moment. It even happens to young guys, not just old senators. Okay, all right. Um, but I do know where I am. Okay, anyway. Yeah, let's watch it. All right. Um, God loves us. If we'll trust him, if we'll repent of our sin, we'll confess our rebellion against God, whatever that sin is. Look, any sin is a rebellion against God's way. If we'll confess and repent, trust Christ as our Savior, we can be saved. In the same chapter, Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Same chapter, first verse, the Bible says this, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? Let's break that verse down a little bit. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so it's important that we understand the object of the faith in that verse. Therefore, being justified by faith, that's not just any faith. I have faith that this platform is going to hold me up as I'm standing on it. My faith in this platform is not going to justify me with God. You have faith in the chair you're sitting in because you're resting in that chair. Your faith in that chair is not the faith that's being talked about in Romans 5 and verse 1, is it? No, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the verse tells us the key. The key is the object of the faith, and it is our Lord Jesus Christ. We can be justified, we can be set free from our sin penalty, from our rebellion against God, if we'll confess our sin and we'll trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. Therefore, being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we can say it like this. We're, we're, we're saved, we're justified, we're set free from our sin because of our faith 
and what Christ has done for us. Right. We've taken Christ as our Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, there's a lot of, I will call them religions, denominations, a lot of people teaching and preaching things that don't line up with the Bible. And that certainly is unfortunate. And it can be confusing. But the way we find the answer is we look into what God has said in his word, and then we find out the right from the wrong. And what matters is what God says. Amen. Heaven belongs to God, and if I'm going to get to heaven, I think, I wisely think, I biblically think, the only way to get there is going to be God's way. It's not some man's way. It's not some religion's way. It's only God's way. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is only through faith in Christ. And the beautiful thing is that salvation is available to every human being. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, verse 13. Just trust in Christ to be your Savior. It's been a time in your life where you confessed your rebellion against God. You asked the Lord to forgive you of your sin. And you repented of your wrongdoing against God, and you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior. But if not, you can get that settled tonight. Isn't that wonderful? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can get that settled tonight. You can know Christ as your personal Savior. You can have the burden of the weight of your sin, of your rebellion against God, lifted from your soul. You can know that you're a member, you're a part of the family of God, you're saved for all eternity. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. By the way, if it's everlasting, it doesn't end. Would right. you agree? Right? So, saved for all eternity. You can, you can have your sin forgiven. You can know Christ as your Savior. You can know that you belong to the family of God. And then as a believer, as someone who has trusted Christ as your Savior, has the Lord identified a spirit of rebellion in you? Or perhaps a sin in your life that really isn't all sin, a form of rebellion. Wouldn't you agree with me that Adam and Eve rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden? What'd they do? They took a bite of some fruit. Well, that's not a big deal, Pastor. It's a pretty big deal. We're all born with a sin nature because they took a bite of some fruit. It wasn't the action, it was the attitude. They rebelled against God. When we sin, we're rebelling against God. As a child of God, we still need to confess our sin, don't we? And 1 John 1, 9 tells us that God forgives us when we do. Aren't you thankful for that truth? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what is the end of rebellion? There's two options. Confess and repent. That's the right way to deal with our rebellion. Or continue and be ruined. You say, Pastor, are you saying I'm going to get hung in a tree and someone's going to stab me three times while I continue my rebellion? No, but Absalom's given for an example to us of the fact that the way of a transgressor is hard. Let's choose the right way. James 1.15 declares, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth sin death. The end of sin is death. So if the Lord has identified some form of rebellion in you tonight, would you confess and repent of it? Let's have heads bowed and eyes closed this evening. Let me ask a couple questions tonight. How many of you would say this? Uh, Pastor, it's, it's between me and the Lord, but the Lord has identified some things in, in, in my life. And through this series here with Absalom, this has been a help to me to, to, to root out some maybe a, a, some form of rebellion in my life, or maybe it's blatant rebellion. And uh, I've been helped in seeing the pictures here that in the life of Absalom has helped me see that I need to keep short accounts with God. If that's you here tonight and say, you know, there's been, the Lord has used this series to be a help to me in some areas of my life, whether it's attitude or action in my life. Is that you? Would you slip your hand up and say, the Lord's used this series as help? Wonderful. Isn't that wonderful? You know, God's used this in my life, by the way. Thank you. You can take your hands down. I'll tell you what, if you're still wrestling with something that God has dealt with you about, can I just encourage you to get that right with God right now? And 
a moment, Parker's going to play a hymn of invitation, and you have an opportunity to respond and, and come talk to God about it. I would encourage you to do that. You know, COVID kind of got us out of the habit of moving during invitation times. I think we need to reestablish that good habit of humbling ourselves before the Lord at, at the altar. You can come and sit in one of these chairs or up front or even kneel here at the altar and do business with the Lord. I would encourage you to do that. And how many of you here tonight, you say, Pastor, I'm not everything I should be, but I, I'm thankful that I know this. There was, a, I do recall that time in my life where I, had, I was under conviction of my sin. I realized that, that uh, I, was, I was lost, that I needed, I needed Christ to be my Savior. I asked the Lord to forgive me my sin. I asked the Lord to save me best I know how. I trusted Christ as my Savior. And I, therefore, I believe I'm a member of the family of God. I believe I'm saved. Uh, as I used the word earlier, I've been justified, not by my my doing, but because of what Christ has done for me, I believe I know Christ is my Savior. I know I'm saved. Is that you? Would you hold your hand up high? I know I'm saved. Isn't it wonderful to know that? Praise the Lord. You can take them down. Many hands were up. Perhaps you raised your hand or and shouldn't have or you were not able to raise your hand and you're concerned about whether or not you're saved. Now, I want you to know you're among friends here tonight. We're here to be a help. We're not better than anybody else. We're just thankful that someone showed us how we could know Christ as our Savior. If you're here tonight and you're not certain that you know Christ, you're, you can't recall a time where you re confessed, repented of your sin, trusted Christ, or maybe those terms confuse you a little bit, I want to I want to ask you, first of all, if that's you and you're concerned about whether or not you're saved, would you slip your hand up and say, I'm not sure that I'm saved, I'm concerned about that. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up, heads about, eyes are closed, I'm looking around, I won't embarrass you, but I will I will acknowledge that a hand has gone up, anybody like that at all? Right. If, if that's you here tonight and you're afraid to raise your hand, I, I want to encourage you to see me or my wife after the service tonight, another one of our pastors or deacons perhaps. And we'd, be, we'd kind of enjoy to be able to share with you how you can know Christ as your Savior. You need to have that settled. You can know that you've been justified through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only way of justification. He's the only way of salvation. So if that's you, I trust that you'll get that settled this evening. Father, help us, I pray, to make the appropriate application work in our midst here in this invitation. Help us to do business with you. Lord, we see a lot of wrongs in the life of Absalom. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, help us, help this series to be used for good in our lives, that we would avoid any form of rebellion uh, against you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand together.